welcome our second uh, speaker this morning, who is um, Jathan Sadowski, who is a senior research fellow in the Emerging Technologies Research Lab and associate investigator for the Center of Excellence for Automated Decision Making Society, both at Monash um, University. His research engages with the political economy and social impacts of digital technologies, focusing on smart cities uh, systems that are data-driven, networked, and automated. Jason is currently researching the formation, applications, and implications of insurance technology sector. His recent book, Too Smart, How Digital uh, Capitalism is Extracting Data, Controlling Our Lives, and Taking Over the World, focuses on different dimensions, that is, our lives, homes, and cities, to produce an insightful critique of digital capitalism and its implications in the daily lives. This entice, enticing work uh, inspires researchers and the public sector alike to resist this uh, digital capitalism by offering tactics of resistance that include deconstructing capital, democratizing innovation, and demanding data as a way to steer technology to progressive purposes. With that, we should move to his talk today, which is titled Status Platform, Sovereignty and Capital in Smart Governance. Thank you. Thank you very much to the organizers for what has been and what will continue to be a really fantastic conference. Um, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Probably the best bio, best introduction I've ever received for a talk. Um, it'll be hard to top that. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, so uh, as was mentioned, I, I'm currently working on a, on a new project, but still very much in the, the embryonic phase around the political economy of insurance technology. But that's not what I'll be talking about here today. Um, instead, for the last 10 years before that, I studied smart cities uh, and smart urbanism and uh, you know, really tracing its development over that 10 years as well. And so this talk today is really more of a kind of uh, a, a synthetic analysis, really kind of looking back in order to look ahead. What's, where did we come from? How did we get here? And what's coming next? Uh, so then, you know, for, for my time this morning, then I, I want to offer a critical analysis of the dynamics still unfolding through different combinations of power, technology, and capital in cities and states. Rather than simply spreading via one static model, the practices and purposes of smart governance continue to evolve in very important ways. They continue to respond and adapt to changing conditions while also proactively trying to take advantage of and take hold of those conditions. So as a, at a, at a broad overview then, this talk is based on outlining three concurrent phases in the development of technological urbanism over the last 15 years, each one based on technology companies seeking to take claim uh, to claim further power and authority over public services. So from managerial oversight to functional operations to um, sovereign ownership. And the phases have tended to build on top of each other as technology capital becomes more deeply entrenched in the political economy of cities. And the beyond part after those three phases takes us even deeper into crucial questions about the shifting nature of state sovereignty and the intensification of corporate sovereignty in an age of smart governance. These phases are not meant to be rigid divisions. Rather, they name processes that have been simultaneous and synergistic. The framework I offer here is meant to provide a more holistic way to understand both old and new dynamics and the ongoing entanglements of cities and capital. So with this framework, then, we can better understand how these movements and systems have developed, where they have come from, and crucially, where they are heading next. But first, let's briefly set the stage. So in many ways, then, the influx of technology corporations into urban environments is another chapter in the very long story of how cities and capitals have been intertwined. Significantly, cities provide spatial fixes for the problems of capital, whether that means investing in urban development to reap the dividends of growth, parking capital in the built environment to weather volatile markets, or dumping over accumulated wealth to avoid a crisis of devaluation. And in return, cities receive the benefits of circulation and investment. The flow of capital fuels steady cycles of economic growth and urban renewal. This relationship between cities and capital is not equal, however. 
the most recent major crisis of capital, the global financial crash in 2008, arguably hit cities much harder than it hit capital. While capital was bailed out and largely continued with business as usual, cities were reconfigured in ways that further opened them uh, up to new forms of capital, not just financial, but now technological. It's a curious coincidence that many of the main corporate actors in this story of urbanized technology capital either pivoted to or were founded in the immediate aftermath of the crash. If there is a moment of conception for the modern smart urbanism movement, it would be when IBM and Cisco, nearly simultaneously in 2009, launched their respective large-scale smart city projects. Of course, though, these two companies did not create the concept from nothing. There was preceding ideas and initiatives, uh, such as the wired city or cybernetic urbanism that laid the groundwork, but IBM and Cisco pushed things to a new level of expansion. Their mission to create, as IBM called it, a smarter planet, was supported by the existing infrastructure, reputation, and wealth enjoyed by these august companies. Thus, the technologies and ideologies of smart urbanism were able to establish almost immediately. Whereas what we now call platform urbanism required a much longer period of maturation, sustained by billions of dollars of venture capital and cutthroat tactics for exponential growth, before it could flex its might. Two figureheads for this movement, Uber and Airbnb, are much younger. They were only just founded in 2008 for Uber and 2009 for Airbnb, at the same exact time, we should note, as when IBM and Cisco pivoted to smart urbanism, the same exact time when the global economy was in a, a, a death spiral. While financial capitalism was dealing with the fallout of its own crisis, technological capital stepped in to take place on top of the world. This shift is remarkably evident when we look at the distribution of market capitalization in the global economy. As this figure shows, in 2009, companies in the technology and consumer services sector made up only 16% of the top global companies by market capitalization. By 2018, that number had surged to 56%. And let me assure you, it has only grown larger and more concentrated since then. Four of the largest 10 firms in 2018 did not even feature among the top 100 in 2009, Amazon, Alibaba, Facebook, and Tencent. These are now among the largest companies to ever exist in human history. To be aphoristic about it, based on these sectoral shifts, the Great Recession could be relabeled the Great Disruption. With, the back, with, the, with, with that background now, I think we can get on to the phases of political economic development. So the first phase then, under the banner of the smart city, the one we're all most familiar with, was led by major technology firms selling city governments a range of solutions and services meant to address a full suite of urban problems. This is where many of the hallmark technologies associated with smart urbanism originated. These systems, which many of us have written about and we know are varying degrees of digitally enabled or data driven or network connected or automated or all of the above, uh, you know, they, they are marketed as ways to make cities more efficient, more convenient, more livable. You know, making a smart city might essentially mean installing cameras and sensors that monitor the use and conditions of urban environments and then sending streams of data to central control rooms, thus feeding real-time analytics and powering algorithmic management. These are the kinds of visionaries, the kinds of models that uh, motivate this, right? Under this rubric then, smart urbanism evokes a, a top-down initiative spearheaded by firms that I've already mentioned, um, partnering with city governments to deliver that growth and efficiency. And as much scholarship has now, uh, by now concluded, and as we've already heard in, in talks and keynotes from yesterday, you know, this version of the urban future has largely been based on a project of using these technologies to enact a fairly standard package of entrepreneurial governance private firms partnering with city governments to enact the neoliberal paradox of austerity and growth. In other words, the aim here is to outsource oversight of the city to the technocrats and thought leaders employed by IBM or Simmons or McKinsey or whoever. 
This is not a complete handover, such as when emergency managers are installed to take control of, falling, of failing cities. Rather, the smart city firms act more like consultants who redirect and guide urban governance. And Nancy's talk uh, just a moment ago actually reminded me of a case recently where I believe it was McKinsey had delivered a smart city planning document to, if I remember correctly, Kenya. But oops, they had forgotten to find and replace before delivering the document, so it was all about Indonesia. <laughs> and so it shows that this model treats smart cities as generic spaces for generic strategies. We should also note, however, beyond this model of the supply and demand for the smart city, by recognizing a parallel form of development that happened in a much more pervasive and consequential way but one that also received far less attention in even the critical scholarship. I argue that the real vanguard of the actually existing smart city, especially in this first phase, is the police, right? The police, not the public, tend to be the actual consumers and users of the most powerful smart urban technologies in existence. In my work, I call this model the captured city as a more appropriate and accurate name. It's a, capture, it's a city captured under the gaze and control of smart policing infrastructures. It's the ubiquitous militarization of urban space vis-a-vis -vis technology procurement policy by police. We heard yesterday about how local governments and small towns and regional cities and the hinterlands are unlikely to have the resources for buying a suite of expensive services from IBM. And this is true but you might be shocked to learn just how well equipped the police departments in those same places are with the latest technologies from security contractors you've probably never heard of. So in short then, this phase can be summarized as managerial methods for entrepreneurial ends delivered by smart solutions. I love a good alliteration. This won't be the last one. <laughs> Of course, as we know, with 15 years of experience, there is often a great chasm between the marketing and materiality of smart urbanism, with initiatives routinely failing to deliver on the promises that prop them up. Even with the imperfect history of success, it has uh, had a marked influence on the discourses and decisions of city leaders, which has resulted in large-scale and widespread expenditures on technology services, and this is why it has remained the dominant imaginary of the smart city in the minds of both practitioners and scholars. Yet this phase focused on legacy firms taking the reins of urban governance is no longer the only game in town. We are already well into the next phase of the urbanization of technology capital. So around the world, cities have become targets for new flows of venture capital in the form of digital platforms that aim to take over core services related to how we live, how we work, how we travel, how we eat, and how we shop, and so on. Ubiquitous platforms that mediate many of the services we rely on daily are now dominant, even if contested and precarious features of our city. While there has been and continues to be important cases of cities and their inhabitants resisting these corporations' brash disregard for regulations and fierce tactics for lobbying, many cities now embrace platforms as part of a strategy for economic development. With cities across the U.S., for example, going so far as to cut investment in public transportation because platforms like Uber or Lyft offer a private alternative. Who needs buses when you can just take an Uber? And similar flirtations with outsourcing key public services to private platforms can also be seen with other sectors, such as the booming expansion of grocery and meal delivery during the pandemic. Why should a city need to invest in fighting against food deserts or assisting disabled communities when consumers can just use ghost kitchens and dark stores through apps like GoPuff or Gitter? Or I just heard yesterday from my colleague Tal Fan back in Australia that she was at an intelligent transport systems symposium where a, a deputy secretary for the State Department of Transport New South Wales was talking about the importance of quote unquote micro freight for the future of urban transport planning, by which he meant instant delivery apps like the Australian startup Milk Run. To help support the growth and operations of these companies, the ones that offer 10-minute grocery delivery, the state is planning to invest in expanding cycling corridors, but not for the laudable goal of giving cyclists more and safer space to ride, but rather to provide more infrastructure for logistics apps and micro-freight gig workers. 
In other words, they are rearranging the city in service of milk run. This logic, plus, of course, ungodly amounts of investment by patient capital chasing unicorns and monopolies, is what feeds the expansion of platform urbanism, despite most of these services being financially and socially unsustainable in every single way. But the three-headed hellhound of austerity, entrepreneurialism, and privatization barks a familiar mantra, and it barks it loudly, spin less, grow more, seed control. Setting aside extreme cases of inequality and insolvency, the ordinary post-crash conditions have led many cities, particularly across North America and Europe, to prune budgets while moving to leaner operating models, driving new rounds of, in, uh, of innovation in outsourcing and privatization. And these cities are struggling with outdated, inadequate infrastructure and underfunded overcapacity agencies while still feeling pressure to be engines of economic growth. And compared with the systems associated with smart cities, platform urbanism is characterized by being more directly connected to consumers and interactive with users, more intent on rapid scaling up via network effects and venture capital, and more antagonistic to government policies and incumbent industries. And importantly, this phase goes beyond merely observing the operations of platform capitalism in the container of urban space. It is instead about analyzing how digital platforms are intertwined, even symbiotic or parasitic, with urban space and society, and the critical and uneven implications of that relationship. As Francesca Artioli has argued, quote, digital platforms are urban phenomenon. So for our purposes then, what's important is to see how this phase in the urbanization of technology capital is focused on trying to take control over the operation of the services that are essential to the functioning of urban society and life. The main strategy here is to turn social interactions and economic transactions into services that take place on the company's platform, therefore making them into necessary intermediaries that sit in the middle of other activities, serve as the infrastructure for capital circulation, and extract value along the way by controlling as access to assets. This is the business model of the abundance of platforms that describe themselves in terms of X as a service, or Uber for X, each one specializing in the disruption and capture of a different urban operation. But these first two phases are in full, both of these first two phases are in full bloom, often concurrently in the same place, though to different degrees. If we move on to the third phase in the story then, it, that, that one is still coming into being. But in the interest of tracking a dynamic transition, we can start to see how it is taking shape as a form of investment and innovation based on much more ambitious objectives. It, is now, it, it now appears that planetary platforms like Alphabet and Amazon have reached a point where they possess the power and desire to do more than just provide services or consult on managerial change. They see value in owning and developing urban and informational infrastructure, or at least seriously attempting to do so. However, I argue that this phase pretends even more than just tech companies diversifying their investment portfolios. By controlling cityscapes via cyberspatial systems, by focusing on rent extraction beyond real estate, the platform pushes the possible returns on investment even further. At an abstract level, the ownership of territory in the sense of not just uh, of constructing and managing a building, but also of the provision of infrastructure and governance, grants technology capital even greater dominion over and valuable data about various people, places, and processes within the city. This represents a unique direction compared with the trajectory of other territorial projects in Silicon Valley, such as corporations building suburban campuses that are like luxury company towns or thought leaders venturing into seasteading. Rather than a utopian enclave libertarianism that seeks to seed from society and build autonomous communities, this phase is defined by a push further into urban space and state sovereignty. It, in its most basic definition, sovereignty refers to authority over, over a political body bounded by territory. 
In practice, of course, this concept is applied in much wider and looser ways, which also account for other relationships of governance and geography. And at risk of providing a definition that is both too broad and too constrained, I will use sovereignty here to refer to possessing the authority and ability to make decisions about how people live, the places where they live, and the things that direct their lives, such as law, policy, and technology. Each phase I've outlined above maps onto increasingly significant shifts in sovereignty over cities from municipal governments to technology corporations. This is a shift from overseeing management to operating services to owning infrastructures. Interestingly, these shifts in sovereignty could even be seen as a return to the original powers of the first corporations, which acted more like sovereign institutions or franchise governments. I'm sure everybody in this room is already too familiar with the Odyssey of Sidewalk Labs blueprint for Toronto and their eventual retreat in 2020 upon facing years of resistance from an organized public. Sidewalk Labs was a trial balloon, not just for the particular ambitions of this company and its parent alphabet, but for the further development of platforms as the model of how to do governance, of how to run a city, a state, a society. Sidewalk Labs gives credit to COVID for making them surrender, not the political agency of people. But, uh, but ironically, it's the pandemic-induced shock for government and the boom for tech companies that has further opened opportunities for what may come next. A report from the Aspen Institute, one of these think tanks that's just full of the global thought leaders, right? Coming around, telling us, you know, what's next, what's coming next, what they're planning, what they're wanting, what they're desiring. A report from the Aspen Institute about digital networks and urban governance based on a multi-day workshop with leaders from government, business, technology, and academia concluded, quote, that the best way for cities to think of themselves going forward in this atmosphere is as a platform. This injunction has been echoed by many others who argue for embracing the platform model in all places and allowing it to reconfigure the operations of industry, government, and everyday life, thus fitting them into the operations of platform capital. States around the world are embracing digitalization, datafication, connection, and automation as core components of how and why a government should operate. Alongside these new technologies and policies, there is also arising a new philosophy about the nature of the state and the purpose of governance. Increasingly, in both the technological and political sectors, systems like automated decision making and digital platforms do not just address the procedural aspects of public administration, that is the how of government, it also entails fundamental changes in the what that government does, why it does things, and who is its customer. Among others, espousing this view, recently it was quite well crystallized by Laura Latuno, who is described by the Financial Times as, quote, a savvy entrepreneurial civil servant in the French health ministry and co-author of the book, Let's Uberize the State Before Someone Does It For Us. Latourno strongly argues for an approach to government based on thinking of the state as a platform. As she explains, quote, it's a bit like a city. We set the rules and build the infrastructure, like the roads and bridges, and then we rely on others to construct the houses and buildings, end quote. Through this framework, the job of the state becomes to build, uh, to build infrastructure and make rules, but little else. As described further by the Financial Times, under this model, the primary role of government is to, quote, create the invisible, unglamorous stuff that allows companies to then develop tech-enabled services for the public. In other words, the state becomes a platform for tech companies who then take over service provision for the public. The X-as-a-service business model of digital platforms is already premised, as I've talked about, on them being intermediaries that insert themselves into any interaction, transaction, and relationship for the purpose of controlling access to and extracting rents from services. But the state as a platform governance model could therefore be understood as a political philosophy that seems to be based on the premise, what if instead of a government, we had Amazon Web Services? That is, the government should model itself after AWS by becoming primarily a public infrastructure provider that enables private services to build social services on top of, which they then design, manage, and own. This approach to governance is rapidly growing in influence, 
such, a, uh, such an approach is not just about providing slicker, faster, more convenient social services. This is undoubtedly an important mission. But the way it's done is equally important, not to mention that very often those things aren't even delivered. We don't even get the things that were promised. For example, in Ran uh, Ranjit Singh's ethnography of Adar, the world's largest biometric identification database created by the Indian government, Singh shows how this view was explicitly held by the designers of Adar. Quote, members of the Adar development team believe that the fundamental nature of government is a platform. This platformized government with, uh, will collect real-time data on its services to evaluate and supplement their efficiency. By correctly structuring incentives, leveraging, leveraging the power of markets, and designing robust technology solutions generating real-time data, entire bureaucracies can be accommodated on a central dashboard. So a core issue here raised relates to the questions of sovereignty over political decisions and social services. Who has it and how is it exercised? The shift to corporate platforms and technology capital generally, claiming ownership of public services, grabbing sovereignty away from the state is intensifying. It goes beyond the public-private partnerships that have become standard fare in the last half century of neoliberal austerity and privatization. Rather, it is explicitly about reconfiguring the public into the private, the state into a platform, and in return, subjugating the public state to the logics and goals of the private platform. Now, of course, it should be acknowledged that all these phases are also pocked by failures and setbacks. They are not totalizing and not unresisted. They face dead ends, detours, and defeat along the way. They only succeed to varying degrees or in ways unexpected. That's what makes these phases of technological urbanism into imaginaries and lodestars. Capital always shoots for the moon, setting its sights on lofty ambitions like total subsumption. But even when their grand strategies and systems are successful, it will never be enough. Rarely does capital choose to settle for something lesser. Capital is the beast described in Dante's Inferno that, quote, can never sate her greedy will. She has fed, she's hungrier than ever. Or as Marx explains, quote, use values must therefore never be treated as the immediate aim of the capitalist, nor must the profit on any single transaction. Their aim is rather the unceasing movement of profit making. And this is key here, right? We cannot look at individual instances of unsustainable companies and say, well, this whole thing is bust. Venture capital look, is looking on much larger timescales much grander uh, plans. It's about creating monopolies, about grabbing sovereignty. That's where the real profit making will begin. The title of this keynote session is Power and Hegemony in the Smart City. And all three of those things, power, hegemony, smart city, are processes. They are not static endpoints, but dynamic relations. They are never finally secured once and for all, but constantly reasserted over and over again. In his writings on hegemony, Antonio Gramsci draws a key distinction that is useful for us here. The war of position is a cultural and ideological struggle, which paves the way for the war of maneuver, or a tactical and political insurgency. The developments I've traced today could be seen as technology capital advancing smart governance from a war of position to a war of maneuver. As political theorists uh, uh, David Sipley observes, from its inception, the business corporation showed its potential, if not bounded, to metastasize into a world power. These tech co corporations are now struggling against any last remaining binds that limit their full extension to sovereign power. We might win the odd battle against them, and we should celebrate those victories. But if we are to gain the upper hand in this war over the future of our cities, our society, our world, it won't just be through defensive posturing and positioning, but through offensive maneuvering. Thank you.